All right, welcome back class. Let's begin by reviewing uh, some of what we've just learned in the previous lecture. So we have at this point now built up from microscopic principles the whole structure and theory of thermodynamics. We began with a simple postulate and inferred the second law. And subsequently, we're able to discuss the first law. Let's remind ourselves what we mean by that. So the first law of thermodynamics written in the reversible limit. So performing a transformation on the system very carefully, infinitely slowly through a sequence of equilibrium states tells us that changes to the internal energy of a system are brought about to, through two fundamentally, sort, two fundamentally different sorts of processes, those associated with heat and changes in entropy, and those associated with work, whereby we affect a change in some mechanical variable. Often for the sorts of chemical systems we'll be considering in this course, we'll imagine that we are manipulating things like the volume, in which case we can do PV work, or things like the particle number, in which case there is a chemical potential multiplying changes in that particle number to affect changes in so-called chemical work. So that's the first law of thermodynamics. And by manipulating it and, and thinking a little bit more about this mathematical structure of thermodynamics, we identified that specific variables are establish precise relationships with respect to each other and specifically introduce the notion of a so-called set of conjugate variables. things like the volume and the pressure. The pressure being nothing but how the energy changes with volume. If I fix things like the entropy and number of particles, P and V are so-called conjugate variables. They're related through a first order derivative of the energy or of any sort of other analogous auxiliary function. Analogously, the entropy and the temperature would be conjugate variables where we know that we have defined the temperature as how the energy changes with entropy at fixed V and N or whatever set of mechanical variables we're considering. What would be a third set of conjugate variables given this reversible form of the first law? That's right, we could choose the other extensive quantity, the particle number. It is conjugate to an intensive quantity, the chemical potential, which is defined as how the energy changes with particle number at fixed entropy and volume. So note another piece of this structure, conjugate variables establish relationships between extensive quantities, entropy, volume, number of particles, and corresponding intensive quantities, so-called field or potential variables, pressure, temperature, and the chemical potential, which tell us about the potential for the change of those corresponding extensive quantities. If I have two systems at different pressures, there's the potential for volume to flow if I put them in contact with each other. If I have two systems at different chemical potentials, similarly, there will be some thermodynamic potential allowing for the spontaneous change of the number of particles in one of those systems. 
Indeed, by noticing that often it behooves us to try to manipulate one of the potential variables like the temperature or pressure as opposed to affecting changes in its corresponding extensive variable, the volume or entropy, it behooves us then to introduce functions which are natural functions of some of those intensive quantities. And so over the last couple of lectures, we've introduced the, the idea of an auxiliary function. A function that moves beyond our initial statement of the first law and its corresponding second law to instances where we are controlling things like the temperature instead of the energy or the pressure instead of the volume. The first of which was the so-called Hemholtz free energy. It is a natural function of the temperature, volume, and number of particles. And we define it through the energy less that the product of the temperature times the entropy. This is a so-called Legendre transform because of the role that temperature plays with respect to changes in energy and entropy and provides naturally a function which is a natural function of the temperature instead of the entropy. A statement of the second law that can be made it in such an instance where the temperature is being held fixed in addition to any mechanical variables like the volume and number of particles is that a spontaneous process is, is one in which the Hemholtz free energy spontaneously decreases. Maybe instead of holding the volume fixed, I want to hold the temperature, pressure, and number of particles fixed, and thus afford manipulations of those three variables that behooves us then to define the so-called Gibbs free energy, which is the energy less that the temperature times entropy plus the product of P and V. Again, another Legendre transform exchanging the roles of T for S and P for V, and there is an analogous statement of the second law. If I hold temperature, pressure, and particle number fixed, that the Gibbs free energy spontaneously will decrease. We have also introduced the notion of the enthalpy, which is a function of the entropy, a natural function of the entropy, pressure, and number of particles. Note that P has changed the place of V. So we take the energy, to define it, we take the energy and add the product of P and V. And the enthalpy relates to spontaneous heat flows in the system. We ended last lecture with a discussion of derivatives of these auxiliary functions and what the condition of the stability of equilibrium has to say about them. So first derivatives establish relationships between conjugate variables and second derivatives establish no notions of stability. For example, if I have a system in isolation and I think about repartitioning the energy in certain ways, I know that there exists an equilibrium partitioning such that the entropy is maximized. That maximum, that position of maximum entropy is the equilibrium state of the system. Constraining the system to lie away from that equilibrium state necessarily reduces the entropy of the system or analogously, the second derivative of the entropy with respect to energy is necessarily a 
concave down function. It's necessarily negative. We learn that that implies, for example, that the heat capacity is necessarily a positive quantity. That was a statement of a so-called pure second derivative, a second derivative of an auxiliary function with respect to one of its natural variables. If we consider rather mixed second derivatives, we arrived at relationships that are known as Maxwell relations. Which give rise to somewhat surprising equivalences between differential changes in thermodynamic variables. For example, if I noted that the enthalpy is a natural function of the entropy, pressure, and number of particles, what goes with S, conjugate variables T, with P is V, and with n is mu, I can relate a Maxwell construction that tells me how mu changes with p and how it's related to how v changes with n. I like to think of this as a little rainbow that one can draw with an auxiliary function. You get the idea. So it says that dv dn at fixed s and p, the other things that the enthalpy is a natural function of, must be equal to d mu dp at fixed n and s. So by noting how the volume changes with particle number, I get information about how the chemical potential changes with pressure. One experiment might be easy to do, and yet by doing it, I learn information that would have been otherwise difficult to obtain. Again, this comes from the fact that the enthalpy, like any auxiliary function, is expected to be smooth, so the ordering of the derivatives doesn't matter. So if I take a mixed derivative two different ways, I I result in this sort of Maxwell relationship. Okay, the final thing I want to remind us of is that we've noted that this particular construction of a Legendre transform implies that the construction of these auxiliary functions is invertible and unique and thus doesn't lose in any information from the original functions we started with. That gives us a hierarchy that spans all the way back to our original microscopic statements. So specifically, we begin this class by noting omega was some function of energy in the mechanical variables, just counting the number of states available in such an instance. Boltzmann identified a relationship between the number of states in the entropy, also a natural function of the energy and mechanical variables. We can rewrite that entropy as a function of the energy of the entropy and the mechanical variables. That's the statement of the first law. And finally, through the Legendre transform, define a function, the Hemholtz for energy, which is a function of the temperature and mechanical variables. So this hierarchy spans something which is microscopic. The number of states that a system can exist in provided constraints of fixed energy and mechanical variables, all the way, all the way to something which is of a lot of practical utility in the study of thermodynamics, a free energy, which you know as chemists dictate a lot of observed phenomena. So what I want to do today in this class 
is answer a question of how does A exactly relate to microscopic information. We know that in principle, it must contain that information through this hierarchy, but let's see if we can work that out a little more directly. And that will really, the, the identification of a function that contains that same information as the ML free energy and expanding upon its properties is really the topic of today's lecture. Okay. So to do that, let's remind ourselves that the Hemholtz free energy being a natural function of the temperature easily describes a system that can is really formulated to describe a system that can exchange energy with its surroundings. So for a system that can exchange energy It can exchange energy with its surroundings. We've identified as a so-called bath. That bath is what imposes that fixed temperature. We've noted that the probability of a microstate is proportional to this Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta, the energy of that microstate. We've largely used, discussed that as a proportionality, but we have already introduced a constant, call it Q, which normalizes that probability distribution. It must be that that Q as a normalization constant is then defined as summing up over all of those microstates, those Boltzmann factors. That's how I would have constructed the normalization constant for that probability distribution, taking all possible outcomes weighted by their likelihood, thus giving me something that if I sum up again over all p's, I get unit probability. This q deserves a name. We'll see that it encodes a, a tremendous amount of information, is a very useful thing to know. So let's call it the partition function. A name that will become clear shortly. So let's think about what exactly this Q is. What does it depend on? So clearly there's a parameter that enters in into the equation for Q, that's beta. I have to tell you beta in order to compute Q. So that is to say it depends on the temperature. It doesn't depend on the microstate. I've summed over the microstates to compute Q. So in fact, Q is itself just a number. Now, the microstates in that sum, however, are obey some constraints. Entering into that sum are only microstates with a fixed volume and number of particles. Remember, the system, although open, allowing for exchange of energy, is closed with respect to exchanges of particles or shape or volume. So actually, Q is a number, which by definition of what microstates are being summed over, and that Boltzmann factor, depends on the temperature, volume, and number of particles. All right, what is... What, what number is it? What does that number mean? 
it itself is just a number. It's not a function of the microstates, just a normalization constant. Well, let's get some intuition for what that number is by considering the argument of that sum, this Boltzmann factor. If I was to plot that Boltzmann factor as a function of energy, this is an exponential function, so it's going to look something like this. Oop, let's try that again. The speed with which it decays is set by 1 over beta. 1 over beta, also known as kBt, is the rate at which that exponential function decays. So for a given temperature, energies that are much larger than kBt have very low likelihoods, very small Boltzmann factors. Their probabilities are associatedly negligible. But for systems for a given temperature that have comparably lower energies, those are going to be comparably large fluctuations, large probability states. So we would say that relative to KBT, configurations with energies that have energies lower than KBT, those would be typical. Those would be typical fluctuations of the system. Whereas microstates that have energies much larger than KBT would be improbable. Now note that Q is just summing up those exponentials. So to the extent that any one of those exponentials tells you about whether or not a given microstate is typical or improbable, if we made this continuous function into something binary for counting purposes, summing over all microstates with either an identification of being typical or improbable, Q then reports on some total number of typical microstates. Another way to say that would be to say that Q counts the number of thermally accessible microstates for a given temperature, which I have, which parameterizes Q, summing over all microstates weighted by those Boltzmann factors essentially reports then on how many microstates are likely to have been, likely to be occupied. Okay, so again, Q is just a number. It has no units. It's defined just through that sum, and it sums up, loosely speaking, the total number of microstates that are typical. Okay, now why do we call it a partition function? Well, let's consider a system you might care about and group microstates into two different partitions or groups. For example, we might be considering a protein in solution, in which case, let some group B be the number, be a microstate that represents a protein in solution that looks folded. So here's one example of a microstate that I would call folded, that I would group into 
some box group B. Maybe that's another one. Looks basically the same, but not identical in all of its microscopic degrees of freedom. Which again, new codifies. It contains all of those microscopic details. So here are two examples of possible microstates that I want to put into some group B, labeling them as folded. Those could be contrasted with some other group, call it group C, in which case this protein in solution doesn't have a lot of significant structure. So here are two examples. There are many others. Let's call those unfolded. All right. Now for either of those groups, I could compute the probability of being in that group, say the probability of being in group B. To do that, I would need to sum over all the microstates in that group, weighted by the probability of that microstate, which for this open system is just this Boltzmann factor now normalized by that partition function. So this is just the probability of a state. I want to express the total probability in, of being in state, in being in group B, which is then summing over all the different possible ways I can be in B, weighted by the probability of that specific microstate. Now Q, being a constant, can be pulled out of that sum. So I'm left with 1 over Q times the sum over all the B microstates, weighted by this Boltzmann factor. Now note the structure of that equation. I have a sum over states weighted by the exponential of minus beta the energy of that state, that has the same form as the original partition function, the original Q. It would then be reasonable to define this as some partition function for state or for group of states B. Now the same would be true, so if I simplify this, what I found is that the probability of being in B is this ratio of QB over the total Q. The same would have been true had I tried to accumulate the total probability of being in group C. P of C would be some Q of C over the total Q. So if I ask for the relative probability of being in group B relative to being in group C, well, that's QB over Q divided by QC over Q. The total Qs, the total partition functions are constant. So what I've just noted is that the relative probability of being in one of these partitions or groups of states, B or C, is simply proportional to the partition function for that group. The total number of microstates weighted by their associated probabilities. So relative probabilities of groups of microstates are given by their associated partition functions. Okay. All right, now, if we thought about this physically for a moment, We've just computed, in some sense, the relative probability of finding a protein folded or unfolded. 
if I was going to think about that as a question of chemical equilibrium, I have some reactant, say a folded protein going to some product, say an unfolded protein. Thermodynamics tells you how to think about collections of those proteins and the likelihoods that you find or the concentrations with which you find those states in some solution. There is a thermodynamic quantity that would tell you how likely you would be to find a system in one of those two states. So that is suggestive of the fact that a partition function contains thermodynamic information in it. stated a little more concisely, is Q related to a thermodynamic quantity? The answer to that question is, you betcha. To see how that is, let's again express the definition of Q. Total partition function is the sum over microstates, e to the minus beta, the energy of that microstate. Now, Q being a linear sum weighted by those exponential factors, I can decide to do that counting, to count up that sum however I want. For example, I might decide to count all states with a given energy and then count all of the different energies that a system could be in. If I wrote that down mathematically, it would mean that I could sum over all the energies now in general there will be lots of states with a given energy so if i account for all the different states with a constant energy well that's actually nothing more than what we've defined as omega in the past so i could count states by counting energies there's some degeneracy or multiplicity of states with a given energy the total number of states with that constant energy is just omega. And now all those Boltzmann factors, these e to the minus beta energy, have the same energy. It's whatever the energy in, is indexing as that sum. So this is an exact rewriting. I can rewrite it a little further. I could sum over those energies and now utilizing the properties of logarithms and exponentials. I could put that omega in the argument of the exponential by taking its log. So I can write this as e to the minus beta, the energy, plus the log of omega. Now the log of omega we know is related to a thermodynamic quantity. Log of omega is just the entropy divided by Boltzmann's constant. So if we make that identification, we have now a sum over the energy. E to the minus, let's pull beta out. I'm left with the energy minus T times the entropy, again, at a fixed energy. Now look at that. Isn't that interesting? We've naturally arrived at e to the minus beta e minus ts. Now, this is a energy and s, which are quantities we have to sum over. But in a thermodynamic system, in a system which is large, we can imagine that this sum is going to be dominated by a single energy, the most typical value of the energy. Let's denote that E star. So as N gets very big, we imagine that we would, we would likely be able to evaluate that partition function by just knowing 
about that most likely value of the energy. So we would be able to compute Q by noting that it is dominated by that single most likely value of the energy. Thus establishing a relationship now between Q and the exponential of minus beta E minus TS, which now really is only or identically a relationship between the partition function and the Helmholtz free energy. Here written in two different ways, either that minus KBT log of Q is equal to the Helmholtz free energy, or as Q is equal to e to the minus beta that Helmholtz free energy. So indeed, Q is exactly related to a thermodynamic quantity. It's a thermodynamic quantity that we might have been able to anticipate. We argued up here that Q is a natural function of the temperature, volume, and number of particles, an auxiliary function, which is similarly a function of temperature, volume, and number of particles, is the Helmholtz free energy. Now, more generally, we might say that Q being a sum over the energy weighted by the number of states with that energy and their associated Boltzmann factors, in the limit that I can replace that sum by an integral, and that omega by some density of states. Note the structure we've arrived at here. Q is expressible as an integral over the energy, some function of the energy times e to the minus beta, the energy. That's a representation or an, a definition of Q as a specific sort of transformation on omega, a so-called Laplace transform. So you would say that Q, the partition function, is the Laplace transform of omega. Now, Laplace transforms are unique and invertible. So just like when we went thermodynamically between the energy and Helmholtz for energy through a so-called Legendre transform, noting things like convexity of those functions, we've now arrived at a similar sort of structure microscopically in that we found a relationship between a mathematical transformation of omega, a natural function of, of the energy, volume, and number of particles, and the partition function, a natural function of the temperature, volume, and number of particles. Noting that Laplace transforms are unique and invertible, we note that there is no loss of information in considering the system through the lens of the partition function as compared to the calculation of the number of states to begin with through omega. If we were a little more careful about this identification of Q as being the Helmholtz free energy, we played a little fast and loose by imagining that the sum is going to be dominated by a single value, 
So in the macroscopic limit, there is this identification with the thermodynamic quantity of the Himmel's free energy. We can do a little, we can do this a little more carefully. by noting that if we take minus the derivative of log of Q with respect to beta, fixing N and V, if we accept this definition of the relationship between the partition function and the Hemholtz free energy, minus log of Q should be beta A. We're taking the derivative of that with respect to beta fixing N and V. That should give us by the chain rule A plus beta and how A changes with beta. That's A if I change variables from beta to temperature. That's the same thing as saying beta kb t squared da dt because beta is 1 over kb t. So d beta is minus 1 over kb t squared dt. da dt thermodynamically is what we would expect to yield minus s. Again, it fixed volume and number of particles. So taking a derivative with respect to of the log of the partition function with respect to minus beta, we should arrive at a plus beta cancels one of those kbt's. I'm left with one more. Minuses cancel the minus. We should get a plus ts. Now a plus ts is just the energy. So for thermodynamic consistency, if this relationship between the log of Q and the Himmelt for energy is correct, if we take the derivative of the log of Q with respect to minus beta, we should get the energy back out. So let's check. So again, minus log Q derivative with respect to beta. Well, the derivative of log of a function brings down one factor of that function and then d Q d beta. Putting in our definition of Q, we have one over Q d d beta sum over the states, e to the minus beta, the energy of that state. If I take, if I note that the derivative and the sum are both linear operations, they for, therefore they commute, I can bring that derivative inside the sum and take the derivative of e to the minus beta, the energy with respect to beta. That gives me minus 1 over Q, sum over the states, brings down minus the energy of the state, e to the minus beta, the energy of the state. Those minus signs cancel. Q is a constant I can bring it inside the sum. So I have a sum over states, the energy of the state. If I bring Q inside the sum, I have e to the minus beta, the energy over Q. That's the probability of the state. So indeed, taking the derivative of log of Q with respect to minus beta gives me an expression for the average value of the energy arrived at by summing over all possible values of the energy weighted by their probabilities. So we'll denote those averages with those angle brackets.
So indeed, we have something thermodynamically consistent, consistent in the limit that we have a macroscopic system, the energy fluctuations of the energy become small. So the average value is what dominates. So we can replace the average with just the energy, which is indeed what thermodynamics and this definition of the Himmelt for energy would have anticipated. This sort of structure is actually pretty interesting. The fact that I take a derivative of log of Q with respect to beta, one of the natural variables, or rather if I think about taking the derivative of A, which is the log of Q, to a factor of beta with respect to beta, I at first order recovered the average value of the energy. That structure is actually more general than that. You would say that A is a so-called cumulant generating function. of the energy. Okay, what on earth does that mean? So first, what's a cumulant? A cumulant is like a moment of a probability distribution, only better. And what does it mean to generate? Means that if I perform a specific mathematical operation on A, I will generate those cumulants. And the specific operation is to take its derivative with respect to this variable beta. In fact, if we show the next order, if I take two derivatives of log Q with respect to minus beta, let's see what I end up with. So two derivatives of log Q is the same thing as the derivative of the derivative of log Q. We already worked out what the first derivative was. That's one over Q. I'll note explicitly that Q depends on beta. Uh, sum E times E to the minus beta E. Everything inside the parentheses was the first derivative. Now I just have to take a second. So if I take the second, I have to use some chain rules because there's multiple functions of beta in those parentheses. If I take it, take the derivative first with respect to the terms inside the sum, I'll have a factor of one over Q outside, a sum over states. I pulled down another factor of the energy so now I have the energy squared. I get the exponential back. That's the first term. And again, if I take Q inside that sum, that's an expectation value, an average. That's the average of the energy squared. You'd call this the second moment of the energy. Now I have another term from that derivative that's with respect to one over Q. That gives me one over Q squared times the derivative of Q with respect to beta. And then the other function of beta, the e to the minus beta e. Now, I could take one of those factors of Q and put it back into D log Q D beta. We know that that's an average energy. I'm left with one over Q, the sum over E times E to the minus beta E. That's another factor of the average energy. So altogether, this gives me the average value of the energy quantity squared. So putting those two terms together, we can write this compactly as delta E squared and averaged, where delta E is equal to E less its average. 
you would call this delta E the second cumulant, i.e. a very fancy name for just the variance of the energy. Again, we arrived at that by taking two derivatives of log Q. So the first derivative gave us the first cumulant, which is nothing more than the mean. The second derivative gave us the second cumulant, i.e. the variance. We could go on and on and on, generating higher order cumulants, which contain more information about the probability distribution of the energy. Now, rather than doing that, let's note that we also know that we could have performed this derivative by noting that d log q d beta squared was the same thing as the average energy with respect to beta. Again, noting the relationship between beta and the temperature, we could, instead of taking the derivative with respect to beta, take it with respect to temperature and we need the Jacobian of the change of variables given as a factor of kBt squared. So then the second derivative could be written as kDt squared dE dt. Now how the energy changes with temperature, thermodynamically we define that in a previous lecture as the heat capacity. So what we've just noticed then is that the heat capacity, Cv, how the average energy changes with temperature, must then be equal to 1 over kBt squared, the fluctuations in the energy. Because these two Manipulations have to be equivalent. They're just two different rewritings of the same mathematical statement. As we argued from stability, the heat capacity is a strictly positive quantity. That comes out clearly from this relationship. CV is a fluctuation, something squared and average. That's strictly positive. KV is a constant. That is positive. And T squared strictly positive. So indeed, the heat capacity is a strictly positive function. More than that, however, it tells us something fundamental. It tells us that the heat capacity, which is how a system responds to some change, in this case manifesting how the energy responds to a manipulation in the temperature, something I can imagine doing. I could take a system, increase the temperature, measure its change in energy. That's what the heat capacity reports on. And yet that response is identical up to constants of how the system fluctuates completely in an undisturbed fashion. If I look at the system and I just monitor it in time, I can observe its fluctuations in principle. And by noting the scale of those fluctuations, this relationship tells me that I could compute or predict the heat capacity, how it would change given a perturbation, in this case, a change in the temperature. That is, I think, incredibly cool. The system can anticipate how it would change if I perturbed it, if I changed the temperature, 
by just noting how it fluctuates in an undisturbed way. The scale of its fluctuations set its response. This is known as, for that reason, a fluctuation dissipation relationship. It tells you very generally that fluctuations encode response. It tells you further that if a system did not fluctuate, it would have no heat capacity. So even though we cannot monitor, we cannot observe macroscopically the fluctuations of a microscopic system, the fact that it fluctuates endows that system with a finite heat capacity. And indeed, this sort of relationship is very general. It's not constrained to this specific instance of a heat capacity and energy fluctuations. It's an example of a structure that we'll see again and again in this course, that microscopic fluctuations give rise to macroscopic consequences, in this case, response. Okay, so that we've learned by introducing this partition function. Let's think about it a little bit more. We've noted that Q contains loads of information. I have not, however, thus far convinced you that you could actually hope to compute Q. All right, let's think about a concrete example. Let's think about a collection of spins on a lattice that don't interact. And let's consider those spins in contact with the bath at fixed temperature. All right, so that system would look something like this. There's our lattice. At each one of those lattice positions is a spin. Maybe it's pointing up, like S1. Maybe it's pointing down, like S2. Etc. Let's imagine I have n of them. And those spins can either exist in one of those two states, either up or down, that will denote as plus or minus one. So the calculation of Q, very generally, proceeding through summing overall possible microstates weighted by the Boltzmann factor of that microstate. To compute this Q, we need to identify generically two different features. We need to think about what exactly defines the microstate and what is the energy associated with that microstate. So in this case, the microstate, if I wanted to tell you all of the gory detail of a specific state of this spin system, what I would need to do is I would need to tell you a vector of whether or not that incorporates elements for all spins and says whether or not each one is up or down. So I'd have to tell you the instantaneous state of spin one, spin two, all the way up to the state of spin n. It's an n-length vector of numbers, all being plus or minus one for each individual microstate. Now the energy of the state 
In this case, we will take, as imagining that these spins are in some magnetic field that makes it favorable for them to be pointing up. So I will associate with a collection of spins an energy which sums over all the spins and multiplies that with an energy scale epsilon divided by two with a minus out inside, minus out in front. I can imagine affecting this energy function by applying an external field and in the limit that those spins don't interact, I'm essentially biasing the net magnetization, the net polarization of spins up and down to be aligned with that field. Okay, now for this non-interacting system, the probability of a microstate being proportional to that Boltzmann factor has a specific form, a very special form that's going to make this calculation tractable. Namely, the fact that that energy can be written as a sum of the individual spins. If I plug that in, gives me an exponential of beta epsilon over 2, a sum over all the spins. Now, a property of an exponential is that if I take an exponential of a sum, it is equal to a product of exponentials, which means that this probability for an entire microstate can be re rewritten as a product over all the spins, e to the minus beta e, in this case epsilon by 2, times the value of that spin. Namely, the probability of a microstate, which is a vector of n numbers, whether it's spins are up or down, turns into a product of probabilities of each individual spin. You would say that that pro probability distribution factorizes. It can be written as the probability of spin one times the probability of spin two, all the way up to the probability of spin n. The probability of seeing all of the spins in some specific arrangement is nothing more than the product of the probability that an individual spin is in some specific state. Now this only occurs because the energies of each of the spins are independent. The probability of a specific spin being up or down is only dependent on that specific spin. So the statistics of whether or not a tagged spin is up or down are completely independent, statistically independent, of the states of all the other spins. This means that this problem of spins on a lattice at some finite temperature is really no different from the problem of flipping coins. I in, implicitly assume that every time I flip a coin, whether or not it's heads or tails is independent of the coin flip before it. So the probability of seeing a specific sequence of heads, of heads or tails is just given by a factorization of the probability, a product of probabilities of each individual outcome. That's what we've just found here. Now, in such a case, if the probabilities factorize, that means that the calculation of the partition function can also leverage that math, that simplification. Specifically, if we write down Q, it's a sum over all the microstates, which means I need to sum over S1 being plus or minus 1. I need to sum over S2 being plus or minus 1, etc. 
all the way up to Sn, each weighted by this Boltzmann factor. If I plug in the energy of that state, epsilon by two, sum over all the Si's. The fact that the probability factorizes is the same reason that the partition function will factorize. So specifically, I can write this sum over all the microstates generically as a sum over the states of S1, the states of S2, all the way up to all the states of Sn. I can factorize that probability as e to the, e to the beta epsilon by 2 S1 times e to the beta epsilon by 2 S2 all the way up to e to the beta epsilon by 2 Sn. This factor depends only on S1, so I can move it through all of the sums and associate it with only the sum over S1. Similarly, this factor depends only on S2, so I can associate it with only that sum. Each term in that product of exponentials is analogously associated with its individual sum, which means that this whole partition function can be written down as one big product over all the i spins, noting that all of them are the same, I need to then just sum over an individual spin, say S1, in the two states that it can exist in, plus or minus one. So I take each one of these exponential factors, I associate with it, with it as its own sum, noting that all of those sums are going to be the same, it's just some big product. So we would identify this sum over a specific spin, the first spin, summing over all its possible states as some little q, some single spin partition function, and thus if I take in you know, if I take a product n times that single spin partition function, the whole partition function results in just q raised to that n, in, in factors of that single spin partition function. So if I can compute that little q, which is just summing over two, two exponentials, I've thus computed the big Q, the total partition function. Noting that the probability of an individual spin, P of S, is independent of all the others, I can write down explicitly the probability of seeing any one of those spins being in some state up or down. It, in general, because it factorizes, is just proportional to its own Boltzmann factor, e to the minus beta times the dynamically changing variable s, whether or not it's up or down. And I can then normalize it with this single spin partition function by just summing over both of its possible outcomes, whether or not it's up or down. If I have the probability of a spin, I can compute the average value of the spin by taking the probability that it was in state one times its value of state one plus the probability it was minus one times that value. Plugging in the probability of the spin, I get a difference of exponentials. over the sum of exponentials, 
if the arguments of those exponentials have opposite signs, as they do here, this is nothing but the hyperbolic tangent function e to the minus e to the beta epsilon by two. So then that is something that's simple to plot. The average value of the spin as a function of epsilon in units of kvt. Hyperbolic tangent is something that at large positive arguments goes to one, at large negative arguments goes to minus one, and at zero is zero. So the average value of the spin looks something like that. Essentially saying that if I flip the sign of epsilon, I flip the sign of the magnetic field, I can either push and have that field get very large or very small. I can flip, I can make the system, I can make an individual spin very highly likely point along that field. So indeed, we can manipulate the partition function in this non-interacting case and compute anything we'd like with it. Now, this was, apart from some new mathematical manipulations like factorization that we haven't seen before, I think not so difficult. And this was done for a system where I have fixed the temperature which means that the energy is allowed to fluctuate. We've noted in this discussion, in this lecture thus far, that the Laplace transform relationship between counting systems at constant energy or constant temperature tells us that we should not have lost any information in going between those two different representations. In fact, this is a case where we can convince ourselves explicitly that by doing this analysis at fixed temperature or fixed energy, we get the same result. So instead of fixing the temperature, we could have fixed the total energy in the system. And my claim that there's a uniqueness between these two representations suggests that we should get the same sort of result. Now note, if we fix the energy, this is gonna be a, a more difficult calculation. So the energy of the system minus epsilon by two, sum over all the spins, if that's fixed, there's gonna be a specific number of states allowed for that fixed energy. And we've gotta figure out a way to do the counting of all of those states such that we can compute, for example, omega, and thus understand some of the statistical properties of the system. We can do this in this case by noting that because all of the individual spins are either up or down, the energy actually depends only on how many are up relative to how many are down. So let's define an up as the number of spins pointing up, so plus one. If the total n is fixed, then n minus n up gives me the number that are pointing down. So I can essentially group that sum into two groups, ones that are pointing up, ones that are pointing down. And I can rewrite that sum as a fraction of the spins that are pointing up. So if I pull out minus n, I get one minus two n up over n. Let's define this as the fraction up, little f. So then the total energy is just epsilon by two, n times one minus two f. Now the number 
of microstates with a fixed value of energy. That's what we've defined as omega. It depends uniquely on how many are pointing up. That's what we've just convinced ourselves of. So now I have to ask, for a given, for a set number of up spins, how many ways can I arrange those in up spins in a lattice of n total spins? That's a combinatorical problem that you all now have some experience with having worked through the last homework set. If I have n total spins, it's a problem of n choose m, in this case, n factorial total number of spins less n minus n up factorial and accounting for n up permutations. So again, because the energy is uniquely defined by the number of up spins, I just need to ask how many ways can I arrange in up spins in an n spin lattice? Now the entropy of this state of this system with n up spins is just kb log omega. We've computed explicitly omega, which means we have an explicit equation for the entropy. If we note further Stirling's approximation, which again, you all have now been exposed to in your homework, that log n factorial is to a very good approximation in log n minus n. And we imagine that this system is large. We can plug in omega here. And what we'll get is kb n. It will scale extensively in the number of spins and write it as a fraction of the number up, f log f plus one minus f log one minus f. That's a general result for the entropy of mixing some number up in some set that's larger than that. Okay, so why did we do this? If we have the entropy, we could in fact have computed that we could in fact compute the temperature. One over the temperature is how the entropy changes with energy. Now the energy depends in a simple way on the fraction up as we've represented the entropy as well. So it behooves us to compute these derivatives with respect to f. So we can enter df de ds df, use that chain rule identification. df de, from here, this was the energy is related to minus epsilon f times n. I take a derivative that gives me epsilon n, the minus sign. ds df is also a simple derivative to take. Going through that, I would arrive at epsilon n kb log f minus log one minus f. In fact, I can solve for f. I would get f is equal to e to the beta epsilon over one plus e to the beta epsilon. Now the 
net magnetization, the average value of the spin, little s, this is the net magnetization, it's 1 minus 2f, So if I plug in F for that S, I get that S is equal to the fraction, or not the fraction, but the average amount of S is then e to the beta epsilon by two minus e to the beta epsilon by two with a minus over e to the beta epsilon by 2 plus e to the beta epsilon by 2 with a minus, which is nothing more than the hyperbolic tangent e to the beta, uh, eps, uh, beta epsilon by 2. So the entropy, or the, excuse me, the average value of the magnetization as a function of beta epsilon is a hyperbolic tangent function, which is precisely what we arrived at here. Now note, arriving at this equation in this way through changing through a system that can exchange energy is much more simple than all of this complicated gymnastics we just had to do here and all these combinatorics. And the reason for that is, is that we had a global constraint that fix the energy, which essentially says that the statistics of one spin is no longer independent of all the other spins. If I fix the total energy, I can't flip one spin without correspondingly flipping another spin to conserve that total energy. Nevertheless, if you do that calculation, and I implore you all to do this yourselves, you will arrive at the exact same expression. So indeed, computing the partition function and using that partition function to get information about the average state of a spin is done, gives you a result which is equivalent to our original isolated system sorts of calculations whereby the total energy is held fixed and provided definitions for what we mean by the temperature. Okay, um, so that's all I have. I hope you had a good week, and I'll look forward to our discussions in the live session this Thursday.